You're on. Okay, good evening. And welcome to, to our public lecture series. This lecture is hosted by Faculty of Science and Engineering. And the idea behind this lecture series is to promote engineering. This activity is part of our engineering week activity. Now, the normal process in protocol and events such as this would be that for the guest speaker, you would actually go and look up their biography. And as part of their biography, you would actually extol their virtues and you know, um, their publication records and their major scientific achievements. But having talked to Khan today, one of the ideas that he's trying to get across is, is the idea of moving forward the argument that someone merits. So in that respect, maybe I will leave the description of his achievements to date, maybe to the end of the seminar this evening. And in other words, that the argument that he presents must stand on its own. The second thing that I notice is that when you look at the first slide that, that Khan has presented, there are no embellishments. He's not relying on, on the status of the Faculty of Science and Engineering in terms of a local bottom or the University of Limerick or professional uh, society or the Engineers Ireland. Again, I'm not sure whether that's deliberate or not, but again, that, that comes to mind. So with that, the title of the talk that is presented, Newton's Legacy to Today's Economic, Ecological and Ideological Crisis. And with that, Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm flattered that I have such a, a big crowd. Um, last week saw the death of J.D. Salinger, the author of one of the most iconic novels of the 20th century, The Catcher in the Rye. The story is of an angst-ridden teenager, Holden Caulfield, who has just been expelled for the umpteenth time from secondary school. It continues to have universal appeal to teenagers today who find in Holden a reflection of their own rebelliousness and aversion to the phony. The title is drawn from Holden's conversation with his younger sister, Phoebe, with whom he has his most truthful relationship, when he describes what he would like to be when he grows up. He says, and a quote from the book. Anyway, I keep picturing all these little kids playing some game in this big field of rye and all. Thousands of little kids and nobody's around. Nobody big, I mean, except me. And I'm standing at the edge of some crazy cliff. What I have to do, I have to catch everybody if they start to go over the cliff. I mean, if they're running and they don't look where they're going, I have to come out of somewhere and catch them. That's all I do all day. I just be the catcher in the rye and all. I know it's crazy, but that's the only thing I'd really like to be. I know it's crazy. And that's the metaphor for my talk tonight. The aversion to the phony and saving the children from going over the cliff. The world is running blindly towards the cliff on four fronts. One, the ecological and environmental disaster. We're rapidly approaching the zero point in terms of population growth, the consumption of finite resources, carbon gas emissions, and the mass <coughs> extinction of species. Two, the inappropriateness of the notion of private property with regard to intellectual property. Essentially, the failure to resolve this issue in 2000 led to the dot-com bubble bursting. And the US administration's decision was to facilitate real estate investment to keep the economy going and push the recession off. So today's meltdown is simply the price being paid for measures taken to avoid recession a few years ago. Three, the threat to the biogenetic inheritance of humanity with new biogenetics technology. A report just published last month from the Fast Futures Research Group in the UK, um, The Shape of Jobs to Come. 
include the career of genomics architect, baby designer, end of life planner, and other such. This is frightening. But much more frightening is the unquestioning acceptance of such a future in the report that it prompts the question, was Hitler before his time? And four, last but by no means least, the new forms of apartheid, gated communities, racism towards immigrants, slums, and the increasing gap between rich and poor across the world. These four trends in the modern world are pushing us all towards the apocalypse, towards the cliff edge. For those who ask, who do I think I am? What expertise has Kamla Tussie got to comment with authority on these issues? I reply, I am not an expert, and that very fact qualifies me to comment. We must declare an end to the modern cult of the expert. That detached individual who is very knowledgeable about isolated bits of information, but ignorant of the whole of which the bits are a part. Once a gap appears between the facts and the meaning of the facts, truth and understanding fall into that gap. For the man with a hammer, every problem is a nail. For the medical expert, every problem can be cured with a pill. For the surgeon, every problem can be cured with a knife. For the psychiatrist, we're all crazy. For the military industrial complex, every problem requires a war. When we hand it over to the scientists, we got thalidomide. We got nuclear energy. We got bottle feeding. We got Valium. When we trusted the financial regulators, we got meltdown. It is time for us non-experts to become catchers in the rye. But first, we must remove the scales from our eyes and deal with some phonies. And the first phony is myself. I remove the professor from in front of my name, my, the infallible professor. So I stand in front of you as a very fallible human being. And tonight, we're going to knock some icons off their pedestals and reveal their very fallibility also. I should also say that my name is on the paper. But this paper was forged not in academia, but in the white heat of the kitchen table at home. And the kitchen table at home, going back all my life. And the title of my talk is taken from the two apple fall metaphors that form the basis of our civilization in the Western world. The fall of man, when Adam partook of the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge and was duly expelled from the Garden of Eden. And the Newton anecdote that it was on spotting an apple falling from a tree that he developed, he got an inspiration for the universal law of gravitation. In tonight's talk, it is intended to trace the direct lineage of today's economic, ecological, and ideological crises to the flaws in Newton's methods and theories and their resultant ideology. Today's ideology was nurtured in Newton's cradle. Excuse me. Today, Newton is remembered for two huge contributions to mathematics and physics, the differential calculus and the laws of motion. These achievements underpin most of the technological developments for the past 300 years, including putting a man on the moon. They also wiped out earlier superstitions, such as the difference between heavenly matter and earthly matter by revealing that they were actually the same, following the same laws, the same natural laws. However, these achievements led to a new set of superstitions that we'll now deal with. The calculus was the mathematical attempt to capture the essence of motion, 
This is an issue that had niggled mathematicians and thinkers since Zeno's paradoxes in ancient Greece. And Newton led the way to elucidating this new mathematics. So we're going to take the example of the instantaneous rate of change of the area of a square with the length of its side to illustrate Newton's method of deriving the differential calculus. So if you look at the blue square, it's of side x, so its area a is x squared. If we increase x by a little bit dx, then we find that the increase in area consists of the two yellow bits, which has an have area x times dx, so we have two of those, 2x dx, and the little red square up there, dx squared. And if we divide by dx, we get the rate of change of area with x is dA over dx is 2x plus dx. Okay? Now, let's go to the next slide. Hold, right. The calculus is the attempt to capture the instantaneous rate of change of the area with x at the point where x is equal to x. In other words, that little increment dx is zero. But if dx is zero, the increment in area is also zero. Absolutely, at that point. So dx over x becomes zero over zero, equal to 2x plus zero. That is absolutely meaningless. OK? Next slide. This is what Newton did. Newton took dA by dx, which is 2x plus dx. And he knew the answer. He knew what he wanted was 2x. Right? So in order to get 2x, he says, OK, on this side of the equation, I'm going to look at the ratio of dA to dx. In the limit, as dx goes to 0, but never quite reaches it. OK? On this side of the equation, he says, that dx, well, that's very small compared to the 2x. So we, we're going to call that zero. Right? So he treated the dx differently on each side of the, of the equation. That is not allowed. But that's what he did because he knew the answer. And this little thing, dx, was just a speck of dust. And they swept it under the carpet for 200 years. Now, that speck of dust, you can keep it, sweep it under the carpet, but sometimes the speck of dust becomes very important. In fact, sometimes it becomes the most important thing. For instance, if you get a speck of dust in your eye or a pebble in your shoe, they become very, very, very important. But for the minute, let's sweep that under the carpet. So this act of Newton is pragmatism at its best. We do it because it works and motor on regardless. And they motored on for 200 years. But in this step of Newton's, mathematics had eaten the forbidden fruit. Up until then, Mathematics, like Euclid's elements and that, were based on a set of axioms, common sense axioms, and everything was derived exactly and absolutely from that. So at this, with this move, the era of absolute validity and irrefutable certainty in mathematics was over. Differentiation and integration was done, not because they understood what they were doing, but from pure faith, because up to now it came out all right. And for those particular simple problems where the answers were already known, there was some confidence in the method. For all other problems, you crossed your fingers and hoped for the best. The pragmatic separation of the answer from the meaning allowed understanding and truth to fall into the gap. Trinity College Dublin's Bishop Berkeley was one of the first to spot the mysticism of Newton's calculus. The title of Berkeley's 1734 polemic, directed against Newton's follower Halley, as in Halley's Comet, is The Analysts 
or a discourse addressed to an infidel mathematician. And his point was that if modern mathematicians believed in this, how could they not believe in religious mysteries? A much more scientific criticism came from George William Friedrich Hegel, a German philosopher who wasn't enthralled to Newton like the other Anglo-Saxon think thinkers were. Hegel was the great philosopher of motion and change, so was alert to the inconsistencies in its representation. And his comment was, the justification of the calculus has consisted only in the correctness of the results, not in the clearness of the subject. The other thing Newton is famous for is for his laws of motion. His three laws of motion. There they are up there. What I'd like to draw attention to is the second law, <coughs> where we have force F <coughs> equals mass times this thing, d2x dt squared. That's the acceleration term. Acceleration is meters per second per second. There's a t squared. t squared is funny, because when you take the square root of t squared, you get plus t or minus t. Minus t by minus t gives t squared, plus t by plus t gives t squared. So what that means is that time is equivalent going backwards as going forwards. And it's the same going backwards forever and going forwards forever. There is no room in t squared for an origin of the universe or a history of the universe. Um, you're all familiar with the Benjamin Button movie. This is where um, an, an old man gets younger as the, as the time goes on, right? Newton's t squared says that that can be true. That's the weird, that's the weirdness of the Newtonian uh, physics, the Newtonian world. Newton's third law the every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, gave rise to, uh, to the idea that the basic building blocks of the physical world were atoms, isolated, impenetrable atoms, so in other words, like ball bearings, that bounce around, and the only interaction they can have is a quack. That's all. They collide, tiny billiard balls, and this is what we demonstrate with, this by the way, is Newton's cradle. I'm sorry I have to bring the one from home, I don't have a bigger, but you're all familiar with this. This is tiny billiard balls whacking each other. And it's not as if the whack is, my pain is bigger than yours. No, in this case, my pain is exactly equal to yours. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. <coughs> The sheer power and simplicity of Newton's mechanical laws of motion and his empirical methods influenced every key scientific, social, and political thinker of the last three centuries, who extrapolated his methodology in an unlimited way to all domains of phenomena. Newton's universal clockwork machine became their model for comparing the state of all things to a precise law-abiding mechanism and for portraying human beings as living machines. Political thinkers compared Newton's colliding atoms and their forces of interaction with the behaviour and interaction of individuals in society as they confront each other in their own self-interest. Hegel was critical of Newton's approach to the calculus and his treatment of forces, and acutely critical of Newton's exhortation to scientists not to think. Newton said, physics, beware of metaphysics. Metaphysics is the study of thinking and how we get to know the world around us, how things in our head correspond to things in the world outside our head. And Newton had said, don't be doing that. 
So Hegel criticizes for that. But Hegel himself fell into this ahistorical trap of Newtonian physics. In his own approach to the interpretation of the economic life of society, he had single individuals isolated from one another, interact, each of them connected with others only because he has to preserve himself as a single abstract individual, a kind of social atom. In this sphere, opposites remain unmediated, unreconciled. They clash with one another, as we've seen, repulse one another, remaining the same throughout. Real progressive development is therefore prohibited. The economic relation of need and the gratification of need is, e is reproduced eternally here. In this view of society, the only possible form of transition to a higher stage in society through reconciling the irreconcilable self-interest of these atoms is the iron rule of law. You had to come in and say, stop, stop fighting. There, stop. And that's the only way to stop the interaction. The rule of law with an authoritarian state apparatus. Excuse me. Thanks for the water, by the way. After the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, Francis Fukuyama produced his ultimate ahistorical end of history thesis, repeating almost verbatim what Hegel had described 200 years previously, using modern lingo, proposing that the liberal democratic individualistic capitalism had won out and the eternal global liberal utopian community was just around the corner. The jaded old Marxian class struggle of the antagonism between the workers and the capitalists could finally be taken out of its misery and laid to rest. Most people today, aided and abetted by the media, believe this thesis and accept that liberal democratic capitalism is the finally found formula for the best possible society because it works. All one can do is try to make it more just, more tolerant, etc. And more. That liberal democratic capitalism is natural to human nature. Humans are inherently greedy. And here is the system driven by this natural human greed. We therefore need to look at what is human nature and why is it under such ideological attack in the present time. But first, we need to look at the quantum world. We have seen that the Newtonian reality is really weird with regard to time. So how does our best modern picture of physical reality, the quantum picture, measure up? Isn't the quantum theory, that's about tiny particles, subatomic, maybe even if you're lucky if it reaches up to the atomic size? Or is there a quantum phenomenon that we experience in our daily lives? Well, is there? Here's one. The passage of time. The passage of time in one direction is only fully explained in quantum thermodynamics. And you'll be pleased to hear that the direction of time is the same as the, one we, the way we experience it. 200 years after Newton, Heisenberg found a stone in his shoe. One of the defining aspects of the new physics is the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship, which states that for a quantum entity, we cannot know its exact position and its exact rate of change at the same instant. Isn't this exactly what Newton fudged? Newton's pragmatic step had kept a deeper truth hidden for 200 years. Well, whatever else we say about Newton, he knew where to stumble. 
He stumbled at the fault line between classical physics and quantum physics. In the case of light, the uncertainty principle shows up in the fact that the photon of light, the photon being a bundle of energy, manifests itself as either a particle or a wave. Let us look for an expert opinion. If I am a particle expert and had invested in a particle detecting machine to make my living, I would always measure the photon of light as a particle. If, on the other hand, I was a wave expert and I made my living from a, a wave detecting machine, I would always measure the photon as a wave. It is not that we have to learn to accept the photon as it is. It is that we have to accept the photon as we are. The photon is just minding its own business. In the morning, if I'm in a grumpy particle mood, I say, good morning, Mr. Particle. And in the afternoon, if I'm in a slightly better mood and I wave, he's a wave. This is the famous wave-particle duality. There's nothing mystical in this. Here's a Kit Kat. Is it a biscuit <laughs> or is it a bar? We don't know. We take the wrapper off. We still don't know. It is only when we break the biscuit that it's decided, is it a biscuit or is it a bar? If it's broken long ways, it's a bar. If it's broken crosswise, it's a biscuit. <laughs> the mystical particle duality. How are you? There you are. Nothing mystical about it at all. So we find that this weird quantum world is <coughs> nearly as weird as the world we live in. It's a very good resemblance, in fairness to it. Now we're ready to look at what it is to be human. It's gas. The definitive interpretation of what it is to be human has never been purely academic. For instance, Aristotle didn't take slaves into account when working out his famous definition of man as a political being. Slaves were included as a different genus, na namely as instruments, albeit speaking ones. For Aristotle, as an ideologue of his own class, only the activity of a free citizen was genuinely human. Could anything so ridiculous be acceptable today? What do you think? Well, try this one. In 1886, in the United States, the Supreme Court declared that the publicly traded stock corporations were persons entitled under the 14th Amendment to the same protection as living citizens. And that is still the law today. In my interpretation of the human, I take the Benjamin Franklin definition that man is a being producing implements of labor. In developing this definition further, Marx and Engels found man's concrete essence in the overall process of social life and the laws of its development, rather than in the series of qualities inherent in each individual. Man, as is well known, becomes separated from the animal, uh, the animal world, when he begins to work using implements which he himself created. Historically, the production of labor implements indicated the arrival of human life activity, of human <coughs> existence. Nature as such creates absolutely nothing human. Man, with all his specifically human features, 
is from the beginning to end the resultant product of his own purposive productive activity. Even walking with an erect gait, which appears at first sight to be man's natural, anatomically inert trait, is in actual fact the result of educating the child within an established society. A child isolated from society, a la Mowgli, prefers to run on all fours. And it seems to take a lot of effort to break him from that habit. A child today is inducted into the human race, not by birth, not by being fed, even a rat will feed its children, but by being fed with a spoon. The spoon is the socially significant object that has been developed over millennia by the entire history of the human race. It's magic. In other words, only those features, properties, and peculiarities of the individual that are ultimately the product of social labor are specifically human. Of course, Mother Nature provides the anatomical and physiological prerequisites. <coughs> However, the specifically human form which they ultimately assume is the product of the labor of society. Conversely, those properties of man that are not the product of labor do not belong to a person's man's essence, like earlobes. It's specifically human, but you wouldn't consider that they're your human essence. So, the jump from Homo sapiens to human is a quantum leap in the very profoundest sense. Man is a quantum entity consisting of a duality of his individual self and his social interaction. And his social interaction includes all of his thoughts, all of his ideas, his concepts, his words. That's all a product of our social humanity. This is completely analogous to the wave-particle duality of quantum entities in physics. Thatcher's spine-chilling utterance, there is no, well, can't put on the accent, there is no such thing as society. There are only individual men and women, and there are families. Only takes account the one-sided individual aspect of man, and not his social interactive aspect. This is the one-sided individualistic aspect of man. This is the particle-like thing. Social atoms, unconnected. Look, there's a steel bar here between them. The only, only interaction is confrontational, selfish, all those words that we use. This is this model. Here's another model. This is where we assume there is some slight, there is some slight connection between the particles. Let's look at the interaction between those particles. Let's set that going. <coughs> this is a wave-like interaction. They're connected. It's a bit more fluid. It's not confrontation yet. It's one still influences the other. No, no lack of influence there. Non-aggressive. It's an almost spiritual interaction. This is the social interaction aspect of man. This is the individual aspect of man. These are the two quantum parts of man. Capitalism, in its necessary pursuit of profit, is actually depriving man of his essence. It deprives his life, his life of any social meaning. It reduces him to a social atom, always at, at odds with his neighbour, in pursuit of self-interest and self-preservation. Indeed, yes, to succeed in the rat race, you have to be a rat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This state of the human that capitalism creates has to be presented as the natural state of man. So the one-sided theory of man as an isolated social atom 
is an ideological assault on the root of our very humanity itself. This is what our human, this is what makes us human. This is Homo sapiens. Back to the animal, the Darwinist. Wouldn't Darwin turn in his grave if he knew that the characteristics that he attributed to the animal kingdom were the last word in human culture at the start of the 21st century? How is our human essence being actually robbed by capital today? <coughs> Up until the Middle Ages, <coughs> a lot of the land in England and Ireland were still worked in common. in the interests of the whole community. Today, very little commons are left. I think some of the tops of the mountains down in Kerry are not worth putting a fence around them. They're still commonage. And sometimes, maybe a village green, that might still be a common. In the 17th century, the best land was being fenced and enclosed by the local gentry. And that gave rise to this protest the goose and the commons. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the goose. The law demands that we atone. When we take things we do not own, but leaves the lords and ladies fine who take things that are yours and mine. The poor and wretched don't escape if they conspire the law to break, this must be so, but they endure those who conspire the law to make. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common. The geese will steal a common lack till they go and steal it back. This is still going on today. We are being robbed. We are being robbed blind. We are being robbed in broad daylight and the confidence trick is that we cannot see it. In order to understand the future, we have to go back to the very beginning. In the beginning, the resources of the earth were free to all. Man and other animals roamed around it, hunting and gathering. Like all other species, we had territories, but these were tribal, not individual. About 10,000 years ago, the domestication of animals and the cultivation of crops indelibly imprinted the hand of man into the virgin soil. And another quantum entity, land, arose. Land consisting of the virgin earth and the land value, the encapsulated, socially generated knowledge of the human race to that point. The commons consisted of the land managed and worked in common in the interest of the whole community, as I said. <coughs> the enclosure of the commons and the establishing the rights of, private, of, of a private individual to own this land and with it the socially generated intellectual property embodied in it is the first robbery that is tacitly unquestioned in our present society. The additional granting to that individual of the right to extract a rent from allowing other individuals to use this land is the second robbery that is tacitly unquestioned in our current society. So I use the term rent for that portion of income derived from title or entitlement to the product of what is socially generated knowledge. The original meaning of the term patent, indeed, was a grant of land. Now, the privatization of the commons was never an easy process. And so, with private property and land came the necessary accompanying rule of law. In Roman times, Roman law codified many of the practices of private property, such as primogeniture, the eldest sons got everything, However, still in Roman times, bodies of water, shorelines, wildlife, and the air 
were explicitly classified as res communes, resources available to all. During the Middle Ages, kings and feudal lords often claimed title to rivers, forests, wild animals, only to have such claims periodically rebuked. Our own King John, of all, was forced to sign the Magna Carta in 1215, re-establishing forests and fisheries as res communes. This Magna Carta was probably the first universal declaration of human rights in history. So what are the additional res communes we need to reclaim today? What embodies the socially generated knowledge of the human race today? What today is the birthright of every human being? The birthright that has somehow been commandeered into private hands, in such a slate of hand that we're unaware of it. There are three streams, nature, community, and culture. In nature, well, air, water, DNA, photosynthesis, seeds, topsoil, air waves, minerals, animals, plants, antibiotics, oceans, fisheries, quiet even, wetlands, forests, rivers, lakes, solar energy, wind energy. In our community, streets, playgrounds, the calendar, holidays, universities, libraries, museums, social insurance, law, money, accounting standards, if only they'd enforce them, capital markets, political institutions, farmers markets, flea markets, and culture. Language, philosophy, religion, physics, chemistry, musical instruments, classical music, jazz, hip hop, astronomy, electronics, the internet, the broadcast spectrum, medicine, biology, mathematics, open source software, the list goes on. But there's one list that seems to be, that, there's one item that seems to be missed, and that is spoons. And by spoons, I mean commodities. In the first chapter of Das Kapital, Marx identified the duality of the commodity, yet another quantum entity. The duality of use value and exchange value. The exchange value being the socially generated value embodying man's socially purpose of productive activity since the year dot. At any instant, only one aspect of the commodity could ever manifest itself. The buyer only sees the use value. He buys the spoon to feed his baby. The seller couldn't care less what's in the packet as long as he flogs it at the highest price. He only sees, he's only concerned about the exchange value. Now, Marx didn't miss much, but he missed this. The profit on the commodity is not honest to goodness profit. It is rent on the socially generated significance of the object, the spoon. And in today's global interactive media, creative inventiveness can no longer be disguised as individual inventiveness. Its collectivization is immediate and obvious. And any attempt to privatize it through patenting or copyright becomes problematic. More and more obviously, property is theft here. With the World Wide Web, the socially generated knowledge of humanity can be brought to bear instantly in the creation of wealth. Forms of wealth are increasingly out of all proportion to the old Marxian direct labour time spent in their production. The result is the gradual transformation of profit generated by the exploitation of labour power into rent appropriated by the privatization of our all, all of our general intellect. How did Bill Gates become the richest man in the world? It has nothing to do with the cost of commodities that Microsoft sells. It is certainly not because of the quality of his software. 
But yet, why do millions of people still buy Microsoft? It is because Microsoft has succeeded in imposing himself as the universal standard, monopolizing the field and hogging all of our general intellect. Bill Gates became the richest man in the world by extracting rents, our unearned income, by allowing millions of intellectual workers to participate in the general intellect he successfully privatized and still controls. So what's left? With this reappraisal of Marx, it is important to reject any continuity with what the left meant for the last 200 years. Everything needs to be rethought, beginning from the zero point. The ideals of the Enlightenment, culminating in the French and American revolutions with their respective declarations of the rights of man, are now back on the agenda, but with a twist. The French revolutionaries understood themselves from the start as a liberation movement that would free people from the metaphorical slavery of the parasitic rent-extracting feudal nobility. However, when it came to the abolition of real slavery in the French colonies, particularly in the sugarcane plantations of Saint Domingue, it did not come about through the revolutionary actions of the French. It came about through the actions of the slaves themselves. The 500,000 black African slaves in Saint Domingue dared to believe the call, that the call for liberté, égalité, fraternité, actually applied to them. They believed what it said on the tin. In 1791, while even the most ardent opponents of slavery at home in France dragged their feet, the half million slaves in Saint Domingue, the richest <coughs> colony, not only in France, but of all the colonies of the entire colonial world, took the struggle for liberty into their own hands, not through petitions, but through violent, organized revolt. On seizing power, they renamed their colony Haiti. By including themselves under the banner of the French Revolution, the Haitian slave revolution was a universal human emancipatory event. This was one of the most significant universal human emancipatory events since Jesus Christ said, no, there is no chosen people. All men can be saved. 1800 years previously. And that is why Haiti is the zero point from which we must start again. This is the zero over zero of Newton. The fault line between the old parasitic rentier society and the new. If I believed in God, I would ask, could he give us any clearer sign in our hour of need? He has just poked his finger at Haiti as if to say, wake up world. Here is the fault line and here's an earthquake to prove it. In conclusion, if we are to catch our children and prevent them from going over the cliff, if we are really to help the poor people suffering from natural disasters, whether in Haiti or Ireland, if we are to stop the destruction of our planet and prevent the ever-widening gap between rich and poor, there's a very simple program to follow. The program is already written and has been signed up by all the major countries of the world for over 60 years. It is called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and it was signed in December 1948 after the other apocalypse, the Second World War. It is the most subversive document ever written, provided 
like the slaves in Haiti, we dare to insist that it applies to us all, right here, right now. As such, it should be treated as a sacred covenant behind which all universal human emancipatory movements must be aligned. <coughs> Article 5.1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights reads as follows. Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate to the health and well-being of himself and his family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Surely we can implement this immediately for the victims of the floods here in Ireland over the winter. We have 300,000 empty properties in the country. Surely we could offer those victims immediate, the immediate pick of the best of those. There. If we don't take money into account, if we, if we value our society, surely, there, an immediate solution. Two problems solved in one go, and it wouldn't, wouldn't cost the same. But we can afford all this, and much more, if we reclaim the wealth generated by social humanity for social humanity, if we reclaim the commons. In order to help us hold our nerve, we need to develop a new ideology consisting of a creative dialogue between the new physics and the old philosophy. Our war cry must be physics embrace metaphysics to build a new quantum world where the social dimension of man is given its rightful place. And Haiti. Well, for the first 10 years of its existence, it was assaulted in turn by the French Imperial Army and the British Imperial Army until the, re until the revolution was smothered in its cradle. Individuals have been doing good out there ever since. It's time to stop doing good and start doing right. I've been bringing pennies for the black babies since I was a baby. And what good has it done? Thank you very much. You can talk. I'm going to sit down for a minute. I've done enough. <laughs> so in terms of ideas presented, I mean, there were, the challenge was to produce that, that can accept it or that he developed for himself. The challenge that he thought of on the kitchen table as well was to produce you know, a thought-provoking um, discourse. <laughs> and just you know, the first part of it. But in terms of ideas presented, in terms of you know, what is the common and you know, where do we see that? Do we see that the different vision for, for the society we have? So we get some difficult people. There were a few topics mentioned that kind of intertwined themselves very well together. One of them was the idea of the commons, another mentioned was the birthright, and the article of five one of the declaration of the human rights. And one of the aspects I don't feel they address properly is that if you consider that there's a finite amount of land mass. Do I have enough left to take that? Come on, you're good at this. 
Come on, give him a good answer. I mean, Gandhi, when Gandhi was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? His answer was, a nice idea if we tried it. Come on, we haven't tried the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Let's give it a try. Sure. Yes. And you're trying to, to and you're representing the physical world that we have with the balls. Yes, yes, yes. Things about 
about cautions, right? So on, right? It's a bit like the, what, what happened the, with, with, with the beads, right? And they were back out. Right? Okay. We, uh, we'll agree to differ. Come on, anybody else? In terms of defining what, you know, what we feel is common, or what should be common, or what we feel is common. Perhaps there is a concept of, of, of property and ownership. When that concept actually began, who first said, this is mine? Who first said, this is mine? And what part did the board play in developing the concept of this is mine? Because I presume at some stage, the concept of property and ownership that's when somebody found out and somebody tried to take it away and realized it was there. That was maybe the first war. Who was there? That was the first war. I don't know. Have we any historians present? You, you. I just want to ask you something. I'm already pulling this to you, I think. Do you think that the Google attempts to to corral all the books of the world and put them on the left? Is that no, he's, he's got, they're going to expect a rent to have access to those, in some guise or other, you can be sure of it. They're raiding us blind. I mean, I think so. Yeah. Sure, sure, but, but why expect a rent from that access? It's the rent, is the rent, or give us back the rent, thank you very much. We can use it for useful purposes. Sure. Yeah, no, but we've got to be careful. If we say, if we accept my human thesis, right, every idea that I have isn't mine. It has come in from the ether. That's what I say. That for me to claim that anything is mine, if I said all of my thoughts, all of my ideas are socially produced, and I'm going to put a patent on it. For God's sake. That's, that's more obvious today than it ever was. But if I'm referring you back to your paradigm, from one point of view, you say everything is social. But from another point of view, there's, 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 a creative, there's an individual creative side as well, <coughs> which in some way has to be encouraged if you're going to have creativity in your own. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I, this, this story goes back. Sure. Kind of I don't think reward is ever, our money, our reward for is the reward for creativity. Reward for creativity is, here's the object. Done. Uh, the, 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 the difference, and I agree yeah. with this point, right? The difference is mm -hmm. that we all have different values. We all value things differently. And we are prepared to, to, to we're, we're, we're prepared to pay totally different values to different things for every individual. So every individual actually decides the value of things. It's not, it's not the shop that decides the value. You decide the value. It's a concept of utility. Yeah, yeah. You see, the, you, how useful is that to me? And how much am I prepared to pay for that one? Somebody is prepared to pay two, two bucks for the thing that I'm prepared to pay the hundred bucks. So therefore, the values, it's value you're talking about, it's not cost. And everybody has a different value. It's the fact that the individual, that's where, in fact, that's where individuality is fitting, right? Because everybody has a different position. Am I looking at a wave? Am I looking at a person? Everybody, okay. the individual is deciding that. Just on the idea of commons, and this kind of idea that if you share everything, it's kind of great. Um, if you think about back to why the original kind of enclosures happened, it was so that you could better improve the breeding stock and things to keep the animals the same so you could selectively husband the animals. And that led to kind of a greater societal aggregation of benefits, which led to the agricultural revolution, which led to all these benefits. I would be willing to argue that intellectual property has led to a similar aggregation of societal benefits insofar as people are willing to invest behind ideas, are willing to put the money behind things. Like ideas like Facebook needed an, an initial investment of 450 million euro, and that led to things, a greater societal benefit, international interconnectedness. I think that you can't just devoid these kind of societal benefits and say it's purely an individual thing and these individuals benefiting from it is a bad thing. I think if individuals are doing something that's in a society good, they should get a reward for that. Well, it's been decided by what people are saying. 
I think we are under pressure to publish, publish or perish, no matter how hot rubbish we publish. And we all collude. Yes, of course. Sorry. So, how do you have dealt with the situation if the black slave revolt had been successful? Would they have been not normally obliged to hand that item back to the indigenous population and send it back to West Africa? Or would they have No, no. So you believe no. in national practice? No, I, I'll tell you this. This, this immigration thing, we have to insist that whoever is here is from here. Yeah. Then you don't believe thou shalt not stay, thou shalt not hurt. Well, the slaves were hardly stay. They were they were brought out of there. They kidnapped from West Africa. Yeah. They they brought that island. Yeah. Then they revolted, freed themselves. It's a simple question. They're not the original Aboriginal population. No. Whoever is whoever is here belongs here. If you were to follow that, that what you'd be saying is um, we'd send the uh, Northern Unions back to Scotland or wherever it came from. No, they're here. We'd send, oh, yeah, exactly. Not Northern Unions. <laughs> <laughs> we'd send the Northern Unions back to Scotland. We'd send the Poles back to Poland to come over here and get jobs when the so called Celtic Tiger was inside the Roman Union. And I think the point that's on comment that. At the very end, but I think it poses an awful lot of questions that, that we should really consider when you say publish and be damned or whatever. We're looking at a situation with a huge humanitarian crisis in media, and you have people on the radio and the television every day, and may supermarkets got it, government's rights, put the corporates together, put the money together. You have a huge problem. You have the national debt being cancelled. But what does that mean? Who's going to benefit from that? Because the regime in Haiti is hated. You know? So we have to answer all, we have to address all these questions and, and, and answer them honestly because, like you said, if you believed in God, 
Right? Somebody stuck a hole in the middle of the world and it blew apart, so we've got to put it together. So how are we going to put it together again? I think that's the issue that there is, yeah. more so than anything else. Yeah. We'll take one or two more questions. <laughs> yes? Well, Tom, listening to the air, looking back in the night, And one thing I've always accepted in life for a long time was basic. I would call it selfishness to human nature. It's, 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 not, it's not doing it, it's not, it's not pure tank or anything like that. But I remember when the very Mall fell and all that sort of thing happened, and a good friend of mine who believed in the same type of thing of you, so he would come and get him out for a long time. It's the ideal world. And I, he was lamenting it, going back to the French Revolution, he said, they'll never be brought back to a look society. How could it The only place that had a perfect history in the search of honesty in my career. I believe that, and I'm at the moment. Yes, I am. And he said, my God, he doesn't go on here either. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to thank you first of all, it was a really interesting lecture. Um, but I sort of had a problem with the premise, given that it's presumably a sort of a critique of liberal democratic capitalism, uh, which I'm presuming was the intention behind it. The premise that liberal de democratic capitalism has to represent Newton's cradle more than that other thing. Uh, I, don't, I, don't think I, I don't think I really buy that, because capitalism doesn't have to be adversarial. The basis of capitalism is two people entering into a contract freely of their own will. The aim of that is for both of them to increase their wealth. One person gets money out of it, the other person gets added utility from whatever they want, essentially. So both of those people should, hypothetically, come away from that happier than they were beforehand. And that's how wealth increases in society. Now, the, sort of the examples that we were given were to do with economic meltdown. And that is the, act those, that is the preserved by the actions of a very small minority within, say, the financial institutions which led to this. Yeah. Uh, so that's basically your, what, what's, what I felt sort of happened is that uh, something that happened within a very small minority or a very oh, small area of oh, liberal democratic yeah, capitalism yeah, was applied yeah, to the broader yeah. thing. When the point should be, instead of abandoning it or you know, making massive wholesale changes, yeah. trying to modify and cut off the worst bits of it. Yeah. Because it's not worth abandoning yeah. because nothing else has ever brought as many people out of poverty yeah. as it has. I'd like to say on, on that point, um, just like you were making the Gandhi quote about uh, Western, Western civilization would be a nice idea, um, Chomsky, who is also highly critical of capitalism, has also been asked what do you think of capitalism, and he's also said it would be a nice idea, uh, or at least if it, if it existed, um, I, I would comment on it, more like what he said. So I think um, without getting into anything too specific, um, I'd like to say that I don't think the capitalist system is entirely working when we have only 10% of the globe living in, um, in circumstances as we do and 90% is living in, you know, in, in much worse uh, poverty conditions. Uh, so I don't see how your argument stands there. Can I just like reply to your Gandhi quote with my quote of my own from Winston Churchill when he said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other ones. I think the same kind of idea applies to capitalism. I think capitalism is possibly the worst system we've ever come up with, except for all the other ones. Yeah. But does that not make the point that maybe we should change different systems? Modify the system. Change the system internally. Don't abandon it. That's the idea, because it has brought many people out of poverty. Yeah. Admittedly, it hasn't been perfect because it has been exploited in nature many times, but that doesn't mean that it has to be in the future. I mean, people want more things. That's in their nature. <laughs> You know, yeah, no, but we've got to be careful. If we say, if we accept my human thesis, right, every idea that I have isn't mine. It has come in from the ether. That's what I'm saying. That for me to claim that anything is mine, if I say all of my thoughts, all of my ideas are socially produced, and I'm trying to put a hand on it, for God's sake. That's the more obvious today than it ever was. But if I'm referring back to your paradigm, from one point of view, you say everything is social. But from another point of view, there's, there's, there's a creative, there's an individual creative side as well, which in some way has to be encouraged. If you're going to have 
so that you could better improve the breeding stock and things to keep the animals the same so you could selectively husband the animals and that led to kind of a greater societal aggregation of benefits which led to the agricultural revolution which led to all these benefits. I would be willing to argue that intellectual property has led to a similar aggregation of societal benefits insofar as people are willing to invest behind ideas, willing to put the money behind things. Like ideas like Facebook needed an, an initial investment of 450 million euro and that has led to things, a greater societal benefit, international interconnectedness. I think that you can't just devoid these kind of societal benefits and say it's purely an individual thing and these individuals benefiting from it is a bad thing. I think if individuals are doing something that's in a societal good, they should get a reward for that. Well, it's been decided by particular right. Can, uh, well, I think the whole return of the commons to the community, it was tried, but remember, um, all animals were equal, but some were more equal than others. Maybe the cons might be, maybe it wasn't tried. No, I think in all fairness, we're humans. We engage in experimentation. And we should have unreservedly the attitude of Samuel Beckett when he said, try again, fail again, but fail better. <laughs> to take you back to the very beginning of your lecture, we, we talked about uh, capturing the rye and protecting the children from jumping off the cliff. I wonder how you see a modern university like this one, which has turned education and turned knowledge into a business in a far more mercenary way than, say, Bill Gates has turned software into a business, and has also contributed in a fairly ostentatious way to further production of the national excess in housing. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I told you at the start of the phone. That's a very fundamental challenge to us from the, the vision you're presenting. I mean, for our director, what was occurring to me was this pressure that we're under in the university more and more to quantify the impact of our work, which seems to me to be an absolutely monstrous and dark idea. It's inherently uncertain because the only way that you can make some attempt to and I think it's a ridiculous thing, uh, is to, to look at, at the things like citations. So citations are inherently concerned because it has to do with the dominant knowledge paradigm and the sorts of knowledge that has impact on the terms of people reading it. And it is inherently uh, discriminatory against people who are on the frontiers of, of developing new knowledge. And yet we are implicated in this in a, in a most profound way. And I don't see anybody standing up and shouting no to this. In fact, I mean, I, I implicate myself in this because uh, I'm an instrument that, in fact, imposes this on my colleagues. I, I find this most disturbing. And I feel you have provided us with a, a profound revolution of understanding that the basic, our understanding of the physical universe itself is leading us towards a totally different understanding 
of knowledge and knowledge generation. And, and the, social, of, of the socialized basis of who we are, of course, they agree with that. Yeah, I think we are under pressure to publish, publish or perish, no matter how hot rubbish we publish. <laughs> and we all collude. Yes, no question. That's a strange oh. situation. If the black slave people had been successful, would they have been formally obliged to hand that item back to the indigenous population and send it back to West Africa? Or would they have said No, no. So you believe no. in the national practice? No, I, I tell you this. This, this immigration thing, we have to insist that whoever is here is from here. Yeah. Then you don't believe that shall not stay with that shall not go. Well, the slaves were hardly slaves. They were all they were they 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 kidnapped from West Africa. Yeah. They had been brought to that island. Yeah. Then they revolted, freed themselves. It's a simple question. They're not the original Aboriginal population. No. Whoever is, whoever is here belongs here. If you were to follow that, that what you'd be saying is um, we'd send the uh, Northern Unions back to Scotland or wherever it came from. No, they're here. We'd send, yeah, exactly. Not Northern Unions. <laughs> <laughs> send the Northern Unions back to Scotland. No, no, no. We'd send the Poles back to Poland to come over here and get jobs when the so called Celtic Tiger was inside the Roman Union. And I think the point that's on comment that. At the very end, but I think it poses an awful lot of questions that, that we should really consider when you say publish and be damned or whatever. We're looking at a situation with a huge humanitarian crisis in media, and you have people on the radio and the television every day, and may supermarkets got it, government's rise, putting corporates together, putting money together. You have a huge problem. You have the national debt being cancelled. But what does that mean? Who's going to benefit from that? Because the regime in Haiti is hated. You know? So we have to answer all, we have to address all these questions and, and, and answer them honestly because, like you said, if you believed in God, right, somebody stuck a hole in the middle of the world and it blew apart, so we've got to put it together. So how are we going to put it together again? I think that's the issue that you raise, yeah. more so than anything else. Yeah. We're going to take one or two more questions. <laughs> yes? Listen to their back and forth, and I think that there's and um, one thing I've always accepted in life for a long time was basic. I would call it selfishness to human nature. It's, it's, like, it's, it's, not, it's not lunar, it's not, it's not puritanic or anything like that. But I remember when the very small fell and all that type of thing happened, and a good friend of mine who believed in the same type of thing of you, so he would come and get him out for a long time. It's the ideal world. And I, he was lamenting me, going back to the French Revolution, he said, they'll never, we go back to it. Look, 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 The only place that had a perfect history is in the social monastery in Montreal. I believe that, and I'm at the moment. Yes, I am. And he said, my God, he doesn't go on here either. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to thank you, first of all, it was a really interesting lecture. Um, but I sort of had a problem with the premise, given that it's presumably a sort of a critique of liberal democratic capitalism, uh, which I'm presuming was the intention behind it. The premise that liberal de democratic capitalism has to represent Newton's cradle more than that other thing. Uh, I, don't, I, don't think I, I don't think I really buy that, because capitalism doesn't have to be adversarial. The basis of capitalism is two people entering into a contract freely of their own will. The aim of that is for both of them to increase their wealth. One person gets money out of it, the other person gets added utility from whatever they want, essentially. So both of those people should, hypothetically, come away from that happier than they were beforehand. And that's how wealth increases in society. Now, the, sort of the examples that we were given were to do with economic meltdown. And that is the, act those, that is the preserved like the actions of a very small minority within, say, the financial institutions which led to this. Uh, so that's basically your, what, what's, what I felt sort of happened is that uh, something that happened within a very small minority or a very oh, small area of oh, liberal democratic capitalism was applied to the broader thing. When the point should be, instead of abandoning it or you know, making massive wholesale changes, trying to modify and cut off the worst bits of it. Because it's not worth abandoning because nothing else has ever brought as many people out of poverty as it has. Um, I'd like to say on, on that point, um, just like you were making the Gandhi quote about uh, 
Western, Western civilization would be a nice idea. Um, Chomsky, who is also highly critical of capitalism, has also been asked, what do you think of capitalism? And he's also said it would be a nice idea, uh, or at least if it, if it existed, um, I, I would comment on it, more like what he said. So I think, uh, without getting into anything too specific, uh, I'd like to say that I don't think the capitalist system is entirely working when we have only 10% of the globe living in, um, in circumstances as we do, and 90% is living in, you know, in, in much worse uh, poverty conditions. Uh, so I don't see how your argument stands there. Can I just like reply to your Gandhi quote with my quote of my own from Winston Churchill when he said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other ones. I think the same kind of idea applies to capitalism. I think capitalism is possibly the worst system we've ever come up with except for all the other ones. Yeah. But does that not make the point that maybe we should change different systems? Modify the system. Change the system internally. Don't abandon it. That's the idea, because it has brought many people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, it hasn't been perfect because it has been exploited in nature many times, but that doesn't mean that it has to be in the future. I mean, people want more things. That's in their nature. I don't think it's brought people out of poverty. It's it put people into indebtedness. That's it. Do you have the majority of people in Ireland who, have, who own any of you don't actually own it? They, they, they've, they're in debt because of it. They decided to enter into that debt. No one's forced their hand. Someone put them into a post and told them they were forever in that and they had to rest. They decided voluntarily. And now, unfortunately, it has not turned out right with them. But no one forced their hand in them. They made a decision. The consequences are unfortunate. But I would still prefer to have the freedom to make a decision. Okay. You're going to clear? You're going to clear your cap? And no question? Yeah. yeah. Maybe uh, just the final point, um, so it was just Con at the end of the discussion. Con is Professor of Lightweight Technology, he's also head of the Department of Material Science and Technology at the University of Ireland. So the devil can quote scripture to his own purpose, and I think a lot of people quote Newton 
to their own purposes and their need to control and be deterministic and so forth. But truth comes in many forms, and as Keats said, beauty is truth, and truth is beauty. That is all we know on earth, and all we need to know. And my attachment to Newton and his calculus is really rooted more in a kind of a joy in the music of it all, of his having made sensible at some level the movement of the heavenly bodies or of liquid motions in a mountain stream and of having revealed in some measure the music at the center of all things. And his, his own uncle, uh, talking about him as a young man, described him as um, someone who wanted to know the particular goal of things. And in his own old age, he said to himself, uh, I do not know what I may appear to other men, but to myself I seem to have been like a little child playing on the seashore and finding a shinier pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, while all before me the great ocean of truth lay undiscovered. And for me, surely these are not the words of somebody who felt he had said the last deterministic word on the whole universe. Surely here there is curiosity and wonder and even humility. So if man has fallen, I think we cannot blame Newton. He falls every day. And perhaps he will continue to fall until he approaches the ground of his being a bit more closely. And maybe he has to get on his knees to do that. I recall Father Angus Manukin many years ago at the time. I think it was at the Ethiopian famine that first moved Bob Gadanoff to that great festival of pop music. And he was confronted with the, the senseless chaos of the whole situation, where these vast numbers of people were in unspeakable misery, hundreds of miles, just hundreds of miles away from other parts of the globe where there was um, abundance. And he simply couldn't make sense of it all. And the only notion with which he could approach this reality was to say that we are a fallen race. We are in a state of confusion. <coughs> um, it seems to me that destiny can be divorced from character <coughs> and to alter one involves facing the other. And we wonder sometimes if the sum of all the confusion adds up perhaps to something more than all these individual bodies aren't even standing off each other, all these individual failings of the individuals. And for me, the only image that is adequate to express the source of all the confusion, whether one, whether one assents to it in a literal sense, at the beginning of the book of Job, um, the devil appears before God, and God says to him, uh, Whence camest thou? And he says, from going to and fro in the earth, and walking up and down upon it. And one senses this presence of confusion of the father of lies coming and going amongst us. This malevolence laughing at the physical confusion of mankind. But our blindness cannot be cured until we know we're blind. And St. Paul was blind long before he set out on the road to Damascus. So, at the end of those few thoughts, I say, somewhat surprisingly, that I find myself in violent agreement with the trust of tonight's address, with the conviction of the wrongness of things, and with the responsibility of each of us for engaging with the big issues as individuals, families, and communities. Integrity leads to effective action. And what we do cannot be separated from what we are. So in proposing the vote of thanks, I wish therefore to propose that thanks be given 
not to Khan, but to the almighty Farhan. <laughs> for his That means a lot. <laughs> for his self-declared non-expert status and his conviction of the need to act in meaningful ways, consistent with his evident integrity as a person.